nine. My name is Billy Lemon Zest, and I've decided a few things. Uh, the first thing is that I am going to start posting these videos to YouTube. I know that Twitch's VOD recordings only last for about two weeks, and after that I think they get tossed down a memory hole. So I'm going to put these up on YouTube. The URL is going to be well, actually, I don't have a URL yet, but the channel name is Prof Zesty, P-R-O-F-Z-E-S-T-Y. <laughs> also got a haircut. Eh. Looking pretty okay. Usually I take about a week to get into my haircuts to sort of like them, but this one was fairly successful. Okay, so when we last left off, we had an almost working... Path node system, <clears throat> 2D path node system. Today we're going to work on the 3D. But there was one tiny little error that I found almost immediately after ending the stream. Uh, this start node, once again, we were still using start node to grab the current index. So our path nodes were getting backwards <clears throat> and ending early, and that's not what we want. So we want to be using current node instead of this start node here. And now, we should have it working. You, cool, boop, boop, yeah. Awesome. So, everything seems to be working just fine. Whenever I hit you, it calculates the path from the begin node and goes as far as it can until it hits an ending point. So the next goal, is to start getting, well, let's see. Actually, oh, that's not, let me plug in my drawing pad. There we go. So we have a couple different scenarios in which our paths can take to enter 3D space, right? So we have our original drawing, which is like a straight path, and then that connects to an L path. So a whittling should be able to walk from one face of the cube to another, as long as there is no neighbor in that new face's direction. Then we have the slightly more difficult um, cube transfer in a non three in a non two D direction. So maybe something like this. So this requires both cube transfers and non-cube transfers um, in three dimensions. <clears throat> so we're going to call this one a cube transfer. No, no. Um, ooh, we could get fancy with it. We can have an intra-cube transfer which would go from cube A to cube B, and then an intercube transfer, which sticks on the same cube. I do believe... Hmm, one of the big issues that we're going to have to face is the way that Unity does its on-trigger enter. because. On trigger enter only gets called when a new trigger enters something else, right? But if we have two nodes right here on the corner of this cube, this on trigger enter is only ever going to get called one time. One time when the cube is created, or I guess when each face is created. So we're actually going to need to store. If we have a node, it needs to know about a 
It needs to check and see if it overlapped with a node that's on the same cube, which we already have the logic for. It's commented out right now. And if it is, then we're just going to store that permanently, right? So let's test that out. That should be a nice first step. And actually, with this first step, if we have it set up correctly, um, things should be pretty cool. So let's hop into our path node. And we're going to need another path node link. Let's serialize this. And what should we call this? Um, intercube extra face. <laughs> uh, technically, that makes sense. Um, link node. I think that's a pretty awful name. Um, it does. It does say what the variable's job is, but maybe we can condense it down just a little. Um, hmm. Other face, same cube, path, linked path node. That's a little bit more plain English. <clears throat> Sure, let's stick with that. Okay, so in on trigger enter, we make sure that it has a, the trigger has a path node, and we're going to basically do this, but instead of returning, we're also going to store that data. Um, I wonder if we can make this a little bit safer, because I don't want to be doing all of this all the time. So let's make a private member function here. Check for overlap with node on same cube. And we can pass in a path node here for overlap. And let's see. So I don't want to do this every single time a path node enters another path node. I only want to do it once at the very beginning. Ugh, man, these names are so painful to look at. Has checked for node on same cube. Oh, well, we'll stick with it for now. And if we decide that this variable if, through talking or thinking, we come up with a better name, we can just use control RR to fix that. So that always starts as false. And I'll say if not has checked for node on same cube. And here we'll pass it the overlapped. So this should only happen once. And it should only happen for the first path node that enters 
It should only happen for the first path node that the trigger enters, which would be two overlapping nodes on two faces. And I believe that we can cut this. And this is going to be overlapped node. I actually don't think we even need an other core. Oh no, we do. Dang it. <laughs> so if my core equals other core, other face, same cube linked path node. Yeah, that's a terrible name. Um, Linked path node on same cube. I think this on same cube um, naming convention matches up with this one, so that's a little bit better. And we actually don't even care about them facing directions. That's something that we'll do later. So linked path node on this same cube equals overlap node. And I guess we don't need all four of these variables. We can just get the owning face and get owning core. Oh. Okay. And then we don't want to add this node to the list if we have found if the check was successful. So if it doesn't equal null, then we successfully did this and we can do a quick exit. <clears throat> Let's do some testing. Um, uh, we are going to need to start modifying how our cubes are set up. Let's just get a randomize going on in here. So instead of, yeah, let's hop over to our cube face spawner. So randomize here. Current face in our face dictionary. So we've got our face prefab. If randomize, we're going to use resources.load. Otherwise, we will just use the index here.
I don't want to call a resources.load inside of this loop. Do I have something called faces? I don't think I do. Uh, resources.load all. And the path is prefabs. Cube faces. Oh, hey -o. <laughs> I should be passing the wrong argument here. This is a game object type, and this is this path that we want it to search in. Now remember that resources.load requires data to be in a resources folder. So we're going to have to make a resources folder. And let's put path faces into here. Ah, you know what? Let's get rid of that prefabs. We don't need that. And I think that's path faces. Okay. Use of unassigned local variable prefab. Fine, we'll start this out as nothing to make the compiler happy. And we're going to go from 0 to faces.length. Ooh, you know what? <clears throat> this is a little bit off topic, but it's always good to sort of consider what each piece of code is actually doing. So this is loading from our file. in awake. And this awake belongs to the cube face spawner component. Now, that means that every single cube face spawner component when it calls awake is going to read from the disk. That's definitely not something that we want. So, let's spend a few moments and fix that. Um resource manager I don't know how I like manager. It's not like it's going to be loading and un... Ooh, maybe it will be unloading stuff. Sure, we'll stick with resource manager for now. And I think I'm going to make this a singleton. In fact, this doesn't even need to be a game object, does it? Let's spend a moment and think about that. So we've got our resource manager. And our syntax highlighting is broken. I'm not sure how I feel about making this a singleton. Who's going to need access to the resource manager? Who needs to talk to it? Well, we know that our cube face spawner needs to talk to it. You know what? Maybe... Maybe this is going a little bit far. Maybe we're over-engineering this. Because I don't know anything else that's going to need access to the faces except for the cube face spawner. 
So let's undo the work we did. Don't be afraid to delete things. That is something that happens often. Um, let's see. So, yeah. Ah, oh, please don't break the... Okay, whoo, good, good, good. <laughs> so our cube face spawner, let's make this a little bit more clever. So I'm going to have a private static bool. Um, and we'll call this face prefabs loaded. And then we'll have a private game object array face pref. Oh, we already have a face prefabs here. Let's rename this. Let's rename this to starting face prefabs. Oh, hey. -o. Okay. So remember, a static variable is shared between all instances of the class. That means that there's all instances are only going to be sharing one game object array. So we're only ever going to have to load it once, which is preferable, because touching the disk is not fun. And by not fun, I mean insanely slow. So let's say if, uh, I think I call it loaded, face prefabs loaded. And then we'll say face prefabs loaded equals true. So we've got a random index, and then our face prefab is going to be face prefabs at random index. Let's randomize all these guys. Boop. Let's give it a shot. See what happens. Huh. That's a little bit strange. All of them. Oh, geez. That's super broken. What happened here? Let's print here. And we'll print out the length of this array. Oh, we got five runtime errors. Loaded four prefabs. Cube face spawner must have six prefabs to spawn. This will be removed later once randomization has been implemented. Awesome. Oh, oh, I understand what happened. I changed the name of this array, right? And so now, mm, there we go. Now our starting face prefabs are empty. So this allows us to customize which things are going to be on which face, or we can randomize them. Eventually, we're going to want a higher degree of control over those, because I imagine when designing these levels, we're going to need you know, to say, I want the L piece to be on the top, and I want it rotated 180 degrees. That is its default position relative to everything else. So we might do a custom editor for that in the future, but for now, let's comment out this assert. Array index is out of range. Uh, 
Oh, I was using the starting face prefabs at face index. I should have used just this new face prefab that we have chosen. Hey, there we go. Oh no! <laughs> well, we definitely loaded our starting path. That's not good. Well, this still works though. Do we have... Okay, let's, let's pull the starting begin end path face. Let's put that back into just our regular prefabs folder. So we've got no paths. Okay, okay. Um, huh. That's not good. So which one is this? This is our down path. Okay, so that was the problem here. We actually have two. Ah, so there are two path nodes on this corner, right? Bunk. And so there are two path nodes that are currently overlapping this end node here. <clears throat> we need to be able to throw out one of those path nodes. Ah oh, man, you know what else we need? Um, let's go back to here to do um maybe we could do this now. We want a randomizer that can actually replicate replicatable randomization. Because that way we give it some sort of seed and we say, I want to test seed 2005, something like that. That way when we run the game and it generates randomly, we can store that seed and put it back in. Yeah, so we can put it back in and test that exact configuration again. That's one of the problems with randomization, you know. You want to be able to replicate it in order to track down bugs. I believe that that is a worthwhile goal. So let's call this random pool. Oh, geez. This needs to be at the origin. Okay. So I'm going to make sure that our random pool, there is only one of them. So I'm going to start this count at zero. And in a wake, I'm going to increment the count. And I'm going to say if count is greater than one, debug log error. And we're going to say somehow there are two random pools. This is bad. 
return. Hmm, okay, let's reopen this. I wish that Visual Studio saved the window dimensions and location. As much as I really love resizing this uh, every single time, it can get quite tedious. So it says seed is deprecated. What should we use here? Use init state. Okay. Initializes the random number generator state with a seed. In more, actually, we probably will want this. In games with a lot of random number rolling, it is always preferred to have a different random number generator for each type of thing that you're rolling. You can imagine that if we only had one random number generator and we were rolling to create some loot or something like that, and as we were rolling to create some loot, an enemy attacked. And that enemy attack rolls a die to see what sound it plays. Well, maybe our game crashed. And maybe we can never replicate that again. Maybe the chances of it happening are so slim of the enemy rolling a die in the middle of some other thing rolling dies, changing how the numbers worked out. So it's always good to have different pools of random. So like an audio random pool or... Um, I guess we'll call this a cube face random pool. I know that I will want to be procedurally generating our terrain, or at least some of the some of the meshes around, you know, the paths. I want to procedurally generate those. So that's at least two pools that we're going to need. Three, because I do like randomizing audio. So I guess we should set this up correctly instead of just using this random. So I'll we'll have a type of pool. Hello, Thunderbutt. I'm working. Come on, lady. This is my cat, Thunderbutt, if you haven't seen her yet. So we're going to need a cube face pool. A... I guess we'll just call this terrain pool and an audio pool. And this is going to sort of throw a wrench into our types here, or at least our count. OK, so in a wake, well, first let's serialize field. We'll have a pool type. And then we're not going to use this count anymore. However, we are going to use a game object find objects of type. So this is going to look for all of the random pools that currently exist in the scene. I guess in the hierarchy is a better way to say it because now the hierarchy can contain more than one scene. So we grab all of the pools and we're going to loop through them and make sure that this pool doesn't already exist. Classic for loop, good old friend. So if pools at pool index 
dot pool type is equal to this pool type. And let's move these ones up. And we'll make our error message more concise. Um, There are two random pools of type. Pool type dot two string. Deleting the newest one. So we'll destroy this game object and return. Cool. So let's use an enum here. Cool. Pool type count, and this will always be at the end of the enumerator. Enumeration. So, I'm going to use system.random. Unity has its own random built in. If you want to use it and you want to be very specific about using it, you can say unity engine dot random, right? And then range. This is the thing we're used to. <clears throat> but C sharp, the language itself also has a random class. And so we are going to hold on a moment. This is saying that every no no no. We'll call this RNG for random number generator. So once we get through this for loop, we know that this is a brand new random object. And we have an option here of giving it a seed or giving it no seed. So let's create a Is seed oh sorry thunderbutt oh, 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 oh. Ah. thank you for hanging out you are very cute so we've got a use seed boolean and an integer seed that we want to pass and let's say if Use seed and we'll say RNG equals new system dot random with our seed that we pass it. Else we will do a totally random seed. And let's do a print a message to ourselves. Let's say that random pool pool type dot two string. Oops. Hmm. How do we check the seed? Hmm. 
Ah, you know what we can do? <laughs> this is really funny. Um, let's do a unity engine dot random dot range. Between zero and a billion. Ah, and you know what? We can actually we can collapse this a lot, right? Let's move this down here. Let's move this down here as well. Let's get rid of this. So if this Boolean is not set, then we randomize it ourselves, And then we generate the new system and we log to the random pool. Hmm, this is one of those things where, oh yeah, I just want two 3D paths. Well, there's a whole bunch of other stuff you have to do in order to set it up to even test it correctly. So, we've got our single random pool. Hmm. You know what? Let's try designing it backwards. This is always a good technique. If you're not sure how you want to architect your code, think about how you'd want to use the code first. So somewhere, let's do a block comment. I want to say int result equals random pool dot get pool type dot cube face dot range something like that Let's go to the drawing board for a moment. So I want my pool to have an array of system.random. And that array is going to be indexed with an enum. Okay. I think I understand now. Let's rearrange this a bit. Let's keep this as documentation for later, see how close we hit the mark. I'm going to move this into the global namespace, pool type. Uh, maybe we should call it RNG pool type. Okay, and then Let's do a system serializable, so this will show up in the inspector. We're going to have a public class called random number generator. And this random number generator is going to have an RNG pool type. It's also going to have a bool 
for use random seed public integer for the seed and a public system dot random rng And let's make a constructor here. This constructor is going to be fairly simple. We're going to essentially do the same thing. So if we want to use a random seed, we'll do unity engine dot random dot range zero and let's do a k max random uh, k usually means constant so it's something that's never going to change so approximately one billion different random seeds are allowed for each random number generator. It's actually a fairly low number considering how big an integer can actually get. But that should be fine. OK, so we build a seed here. And then we'll say RNG equals new system random. Pass it the seed. I'm totally going to copy this print here. I like that very much. And this needs to be a debug.log because we're not inside of a mono behavior class. Hmm. Oh boy. Well, that was that was pretty wrong first of all. <laughs> that should not have been RNG. That should have been seed. I would have looked pretty silly, but we would have noticed that mistake pretty quickly. So that means we can get rid of all of these. This one too. And we'll serialize a field, private random number generator array pools uh, you know it's so funny um, we can go back to our original int <laughs> Because now all of our pools are consolidated into the same the same mono behavior. Instead of having a different game object for each pool, I'm just sticking them all in one. Because this is going to be a lot easier to get. Oh, this is going to need to be static. Oh, no! <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. The problem that I saw is if you have a member variable that is static, it's not going to show up in the inspector. Unity just cannot handle that. It's It just can't be done. <clears throat> there are some really gross hacks to work around it, but that's not really something I want to be be a part of. I don't want that stain on my soul. I'm kidding. It's okay if you do it. Make it work first, right? So I actually believe that we can destroy all of this. Wah, wah. And let's see. We'll add one to count. This should look familiar. We already typed it and deleted it like dummies. If count is greater than one, welcome back, Thunderbutt. 
if count is greater than one, then we're going to do a debug log. Oh, log error, my mistake. There we go. And let's return afterwards. So if that happens, then we're going to create our pools. Oh, you know what? I don't even think we have to create our pools. Let's take a look here. Okay, yeah. So let's say we have three pools. Cube face will use a random seed. Terrain. And you know what? Let's just stick with one for now, right? Okay. Oh, howdy, Josh. Sorry, I was deep in thought. Um, I'm working on a puzzle game. I think it should be running now. Yeah, so you pick cubes, you spin them around. Uh, the goal eventually is to be able to get the cubes to connect in three dimensions. So like the little character could walk up a wall and then on top and around and under. So the camera work is going to be an interesting challenge. That's not something I've done a lot with. But um, I think it could be a pretty interesting game. This red thing is my path. I'm currently working on randomizing these faces in a replicatable way so that I can say, I want to test seed number 12 and have the same blocks generate every time. Hmm. Okay. So we've made our random pool. Let's make our public, or let's make it a singleton time. Oh, that needs to be up here. Oh, this needs to be static. Oh my, that would have been pretty bad. So let's see. Private, we'll make a random pool reference called instance with an underscore. And this will be static. And then we'll have a public function that returns the instance. And let's see, we're going to need to do a game object dot find random pool, get component random pool. And we'll set that equal to instance uh, if if instance is null, then we can find the instance in our code, and then we can return it to anyone who asks. So this is our singleton setup, meaning that now, hey, oh, hey, <laughs> oh, my cat was on the drawing pad. Sorry about that. That means that anywhere in our code, any class can access this random pool without being given a reference to the class. It's almost like a global variable. Um, it's frowned upon by many people. But I think for randomization, if I'm splitting it up into pools, it should be okay. Okay, so... Back to our cube face spawner. 
Let me do a control shift F for random dot range. How many places do we use this? Ah, only one. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, only one. So instead of doing random dot range, we're going to do our random pool dot get. And then we're going to say, what did I, what did I call that? What function did I name? Interesting. So this get actually I passed a type to it. I kind of like that. RNG pool type. Is that what I called it? Okay. And we'll cast that type as an integer. So if it does not equal null, then we should be able to return. Mm, I don't like doing that twice. RNG target pool. So if the target pool is not null, then we can return target pool. Else we return nothing. And let's do an error here. Debug log error. Um, random pool of type type dot to string has not been initialized. Hmm. Hello, Nabzi and Noob 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 No Biggerich. That one's a tricky one to say. <laughs> I do believe that this is 95% wrong. There's going to be a lot of things that break here. Whoa, hey, -o, that's not what I want. RNG pool type cube face dot Oh, we just give it a max value. The max value is face prefabs dot length. What don't you like about that? An object reference is required. Did I not make get static? Hey oh <laughs> There we go. Make sure instance is there. And errors. Whoa. Random pool cube face seed zero. Two. That is unexpected. Why was this constructor run twice?
Hmm, let's add a little bit of extra defensive programming here. So let's make sure that the index that we're being passed. Oh. is valid random pool type is not a valid pool return Oh, return null, and that will break stuff for us. But we're logging an error. It's okay if things break. And in awake, let's do a for loop and initialize each of our random pools. Still very strange. Hmm. Actually, I don't think we need to do this. I do believe Oh, that's even weirder. Clear, what's happening? Use random Let's let's figure out what the heck is going on here. Let's see the call stack. Let's see who's actually asking us to run this function. Cuz I have a doubt. I think something strange is happening. So this is just the constructor. Use random seed is false. And the call stack. Use random seed is false. I disagree, good sir. So maybe maybe this constructor is actually being run by the code that serializes objects for the inspector. So let's pull this, let's extract this print into a separate public function and let's hop back down to our awake and we will manually initialize these things when Um, whenever the object is created. And so let's use a non-random C of one, two, three, four. What?
seed zero. Okay, something goofy is going on here. So in the random pools awake, the seed should be, we have one pool. We get the current pool, which is a random number generator. It does have a seed of one, two, three, four. Let's step into this function. Whoa! What? What? I find it very disturbing that these are always exactly the same as well. Let's try it with a random seed. <clears throat> what is going on here? Hmm, well, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a seven-minute break. And when we return, I don't know. We'll keep plugging away at it. Very, very strange. I must be doing something very silly. Huh.
Okay. So what the heck is going on here? <clears throat> My randomizer... Um, let's get rid of these prints here. We know our neighbor system works. And that's most of what these are. Let's collapse this a little bit. Um, it's not going to fix our problem. <clears throat> Just clean it up a little bit. Let's try and reorganize this a little bit. Um, I'm going to rename this to RNG data. And it's not going to have the RNG inside of it. We can get rid of all of these. This is just specifically a data class. And then we have our RNG datas. Ooh, that's terrible. <laughs> no, not datas. Um, RNG data group. And then here we can have a private system dot random pools. Okay. Do, 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 do. This is going to change a lot. RNG data, current data. Let's rename this to data index. RNG data group, and then now I can say pools equals new system dot random array of size RNG data group dot length. Yeah. Interesting. Very strange syntax. Oh, let's rename this to what? Current data group. I thought I just renamed this. Am I losing my marbles? Data index.
So if current data use random seed, random range between zero No, that's RNG data dot K max random. So here we'll randomize the pool and that's broken. Did I delete it? Oh, gurn it. So we'll do random pool type. Um, current data dot type to string. There we go. <clears throat> so now when the random pool wakes up, it will create n number of system.random instances. Each of those instances will be linked to a pool directly. And now when I call get, this will return a system.random. Hey, hey, oh, ho, 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 ho. let's see how it goes. Hey, those look different. Okay. And so this is a blank up, 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 blank, blank. So let's copy this to the clipboard. We can see our cube face random pool type. The seed is correct. Let's not use random seed. Let's paste this one in here. Yeah. L, L. Cool. Looking good. Well, that was a long and painful journey. But now we're finally ready to start testing our complex path connections. We'll stick with this seed for now. It looked like it had some good bits and pieces. Let's hop back over to the drawing board. So let's get this intracube connection working. Now, the simplest intracube connection is when each node has no available partners but there's also a they have a link to each other that we set up on that first trigger check Hmm, so let's see. Not draw debug path, path node. Let's go up to the top for validate linked path. So if the count equals zero, and the linked path node on same cube does not equal null. Linked path node equals linked path node on same cube. Else 
linked path node equals null. So here are our two cases that we've gotten so far. And with this extra condition, our path should be able to wrap around our cube here. Hmm. So what face is that? That is our up face. Interesting. So it thinks that this linked path node Let's start minimizing, right? Hey. Ho! 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 ho. So that seems to be working just fine. So why didn't it work before, right? I thought we just we just tested. Oh, what is that? Okay, so we got a null reference exception because we were trying to, I think it's the order in which our awakes were run. We want, and maybe that was part of the problem. I didn't check for errors previously. That could definitely give us some goofy things. So in our cube face spawner, this should be in our awake because we're just loading stuff, but this depends on our random pools awake having been executed already. So let's try that. Move that into start. Cool, no errors. Ah. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Wait, maybe not awesome. So this cube, our cube zero, which path is that? Oh, you know what we could do? Ooh. No! <laughs> Dang it. Uh, I was really hoping that we could 
have little gizmos up here. I would like a visual way to tell what direction the faces started off at. Hmm. However, let's not get too worked up about it because our original, we only have two cases right now. We have our case where the path follows it correctly on a 2D plane, and we also have our paths connecting when there's no other when there's no other possible path nodes for that node to connect to so our next step we're going to need to set it up imagine that there's another cube right here that's got a straight path so we're going to want to ignore the intracube path. How's this looking? If there is only one possible path node link. Hmm. I'm not sure how happy I am with all of this. I have a feeling that oh <clears throat> that this return here might have been breaking some stuff. Ugh. Well, let's check that, right? Let's check to see if, um, let's make a bunch of cubes. Oops. And I'm not going to make sure that they're all aligned and stuff. I just want to do some testing here. So these two should be connected. That is my up. So this is a linked path node to the left face, which is an L, that's right. And this is linked to that one, okay. <clears throat> so these links seem to be fine. A straight to an L works. How about you? Okay, so we've got a straight to a straight. Let's test that out. So this is the forward wall. That is linked to the up wall. And the up wall is linked to the forward as well. Okay. <clears throat> so these links do seem to be working. 
we're not doing any early outs. So it's possible that we could have two links that have overlapped. Oh, hello, inked up dude. I am making a game. <clears throat> um, it's a very simple game. Well, the concept is simple, but I do believe that it's got some pretty good possibilities here. The idea is that you start with <clears throat> a little dude, and he's going to start walking on a path, and it's your job to select cubes and, um, you know, build a path for your little guy to walk down. And right now, if I hit U, you can see it's got this red path. This is the path the little guy would take. But currently, I'm trying to work on a system where, let's do this as one, one, two. Currently, I'm trying to work on a system where the path is going to walk up here and then curve around this bend. So I want a full three-dimensional sort of pathfinding game. And once I get the basic pathfinding working, then I'll add in like cool events or special blocks or power ups or jobs. I don't know. I just want to test and make sure that the basics work and are fun before I dump a bunch of more time into it. These are also just really crappy. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Placeholder art. Eventually, what I'd like to do is use code to generate what these walls are going to look like. So it'll look a lot more natural. You know, you could have different biomes of cube puzzles, that sort of thing. Trees, lakes, maybe. I don't know how far I'll go. It's got to be fun before I devote time to it. Let's see, I'm also using a program called Mischief for my drawing board. And let's see, if I'm spinning this cube, and there are two possible two nodes here, Ooh. And two nodes here. So I think once a rotate is done, I'm going to need to shoot a ray out of the face of the face that owns the collider. And if there is a neighbor, this has no linked path. Oh, wait. Is active. 
When do I validate path nodes? Rotate complete. Oh yeah, um, the person will definitely die if they um, get trapped or if they walk off an edge. Basically, if they walk to a place where there's no node to connect them to another part, then they're going to disappear. And that'll be, you know, a cost to the player. Maybe they have to save X number of guys that round. But I'm not trying to make it like... Um, it's sort of based off an old game called Lemmings. And Lemmings had, you know, anywhere between 1 and 150 little guys to rescue. That was kind of fun, but I don't think that's... I don't know. I'm not trying to set... I'm not trying to build that... Build the game that way. Maybe just, like, between 3 or 4 different guys maximum, and maybe they can do different stuff. There will definitely be a finish line. And I've got some pretty neat ideas. One of my ideas is, which one's cube? Cube two, cube one. So I would like a power up that essentially welds two cubes together. Oh no. That's strange. Well, essentially, when you rotate one cube, the other cube is going to rotate with it. You know, so you might have to spin cubes around in order to build a bridge instead of all of the cubes just being there inherently. It's also got some interesting mathematical problems where I'd like to be able to randomize the cubes in the level, but I'm going to have to be able to make sure that the level is solvable <laughs> before I let somebody try and attempt it, right? Nothing is less fun than spending 20 minutes on a puzzle and realizing that, oh, there actually was no answer. Yay. But if you're interested, I have, uh, I've put a lot of my previous videos up on YouTube. Prof Zesty, P-R-O-F-Z-E-S-T-Y is the channel. And yeah, I'm basically just going to be coding one or two hours every day, posting it up. If people are interested in that, they can watch it. If not, I have documentation of my project. And, you know, maybe a year from now, I can go look back at where I am today and laugh. Be like, oh, man, I knew nothing. Those solutions were so bad. <laughs> Which I probably will do. I'm not sure about inserting cubes. <clears throat> it's on my list of possible features. I know that destroying cubes is also on my list of features. It might be interesting if you could, like, you know, shrink a cube and put it in the guy's pocket, and then he walks somewhere else, and at some preordained time, he'll take it out, and the cube will expand back up there. Because I would like the levels to be a little bit more dynamic. You know, right now they're just super static, but that's because I'm trying to get the basics of the pathfinding working. I want to do it in a really simple... simplest test area I can imagine. And then once I can make it work there, I'll make the features more difficult and then test some more.
So let's see. I've got my two path nodes that are possibilities. And this is a path node on the cube that has just finished rotating. Ooh. That should be fine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to get the owning face of the path. Okay, so these are nodes that belong to another cube. Oh yeah, there's definitely going to be time limits. Um, I'm also thinking of certain cubes, you can only rotate them X amount of times, so that makes them really valuable in terms of strategy. Like, oh, I want to get these things, but if I can only rotate this twice, how do I solve the puzzle to get all the things that I want? I also want a golf mode, so maybe similar to Binding of Isaac, where every day they have a daily challenge. Uh, maybe there's some seed that gets set for the day and everybody tries to play that game and whoever can solve it in the fewest number of rotations wins. So there's a lot of, a lot of ways the design of this can go. And that's why I'm really intrigued by the project. <clears throat> I haven't, there's always the idea of collectibles as well. So the idea of, you know, I'm trying to collect coins or do something in the level besides rescue my dudes. So game modes are going to be an interesting design part. I'm mostly a prototyper. I don't always follow a game through to completion, but I think this is one of them that that I'm going to to really just sit down and bang out. <clears throat> Got a big ass calendar, and every day on the calendar that I work on this project, and get to put a nice big X. And so as those X's pile up, it's sort of like, I don't know, a reminder of progress. Because when you're making a game, it's so slow, and there's you spend eight hours, and it looks like you did nothing. The game still runs the same. Maybe it's a little bit faster, but yeah, there are times when you just put all this work into it and from the outside, it looks the same. So having some other measurement of progress is nice. A nice reminder. So if face A has a neighbor in that direction, then face B or path B is valid. Um, I actually teach video game programming and scripting as a living. And so it's kind of cool because I get to... I get to show people how to create their ideas and 
you know, I call programming the language of logic. I get to teach them how to make the rules. But I usually don't have a lot of time to work on my own projects. So I would say this is a hobby, but it's directly related to my profession. So we'll set this to path A. Else, let's log a warning. This should never happen. I hope. Dang. Well, actually... So, which face is this? This is my up face. Now, it's so weird. Yeah, this path node here. Oh. Oh. I think I see the issue here. <clears throat> so because the face that's facing away from us is hidden, the code doesn't actually recognize that it's linked to this top face here. Oh, nice, systems engineer. That sounds very cool. <clears throat> what kind of systems? I've always been really, I mean, yeah, passion, or programming is just so much fun. It's so, so much power to be able to solve problems and create experiences, grow, challenge yourself. Like, it's crazy. I tell my students that writing code is like kung fu. It's that uh, every step on the journey, you realize how long, how much longer the path really is. So, like, students who are two years in are like, whoa, programming's crazy, it's so big. And then I'll talk to them, like, five years later, and they're like, oh my gosh, it's so enormous. <laughs> I had no idea how huge and how deep this, this um, discipline could go. I think that was cube one. Oh. Corporate network design and deployment. Interesting.
<laughs> so I imagine that's sort of like... Interesting. So you just deal probably with a lot of databases and trying to scale, I don't know, servers, bandwidth, like load balancing and that kind of thing. I don't know much about networks. Um, I basically only know game design or game programming. Like I've built my own engine. That's a crappy 2D engine, but um, public and private cloud rollouts now. Hmm. Sounds sounds interesting. It also sounds a little bit scary, honestly. <laughs> hmm. So why does it think it's possible? Possible path node link here. That's not right. Only modify possible path node links here. Get rid of this. This was overcomplicating it. So let's see. I want to check if overlapped. It's on the same queue. That sounds very, very badass. <clears throat> Designing infrastructures. Uh, what languages do you work in mostly? I imagine probably a lot of server side stuff. Really? You're on your Xbox, so you have to use the shitty controller to like type out one letter at a time? Oh my god. <clears throat> that is a UI design failure if I've ever seen one.
I actually don't use consoles anymore. About three years ago, somebody broke into our house and stole all of our consoles, all of our games, musical instruments. It was a sad, sad day. But, you know, less distractions. <laughs> There we go. That's looking more correct. Big money. Yeah, buddy! Woo! -hoo -hoo. Yeah, 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 yeah! Okay, okay, looking good. Let's make a bit more complex setup over here. And let's randomize our seed. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, yeah, C++ was my mother language. Um, I like it the most. I like having all the control over memory. I like being able to, you know, be very, very close to the assembly. Not directly assembly. I mean, I could go in and write some assembly if I have to in like a hot code path, but I just like C++. However, I'm really interested in um, Jonathan Blow. He's a game programmer. He made The Witness and Braid, two pretty popular video games. He spent the last couple years uh, writing his own language specifically for programming games. And it looks beautiful. Oh my gosh. It's just like C++, which means, you know, it's just di translates directly into machine code. And, but it's got all these new, like, high-level features that C++ is just too old to do. You know, it's such a ridiculously, ridiculously complex series of things. But Jonathan Blow is just like, instead of spending five years wrestling with the language, making my new game... I'm just going to spend five years making this language just so I can enjoy making games more. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's pretty awful. <laughs> oh, that's why... Um, one thing I haven't done yet is rotated each of these faces. So like all of the, you can see they're all just like the same way. But I think that's about it for today. I did my, yep, a full two hours of doing some work. I got 
a fair amount of stuff done. Uh, do you ever stream? I imagine you can't really stream working on your NDA infrastructure stuff. Um, but do you stream anything else? Games, personal projects? Maybe I'll quickly change the way the path draws. So if I'm going from core to Yeah, I, I assume there was a big security risk there. Um, <clears throat> it's not proprietary. Uh, he has not released it yet because, you know, he's still working on it. But if you look at um, his YouTube page, Jonathan Blow, he'll have different categories of videos. Sometimes it'll be like, oh, this time I'm going to spend a few hours working on my compiler because I found some bugs. Or... This time I'm going to be adding shadow maps to my game that I'm building. And so he goes back and forth between developing the language and using it in a project. It's really interesting. He said something like, I'm not sure what LLVM is. I've heard people whisper about it and I've seen people mention it online, but I think he said he uses LLVM in a way that he can take his previous engine that he wrote in C++, at least a version of it, and then convert the C++ to his language, and the engine still runs from his language. So it seems pretty beefy. Yeah, he's got lots of very interesting features. Some of them are not that useful. And his syntax is not very pretty, but he said that's the last thing he's going to do is make the syntax look good. Right now, he was just like, oh, I needed a new symbol, so I chose this. Awesome. Thanks, Inked Up Dude. I will be happy to see you whenever you come hang out. Hopefully, I'll have more to show next time. Oh, no. <laughs> That's not good. Oh. Oh, that is good. Oh, it went under. Nice. Yeah, that's what I want. Oh, man. Okay. So, this is definitely playing nicely now. Cool. Yep. Thanks so much for hanging out. I'll see you next time.